Get the popcorn, Frank. Coming, dear. Um, hello, hi, hi. and thank you all for coming uh, to the second of the two-part series that we're doing here at the Holliston uh, Senior Center at the Council on Aging. My name is Arthur Bergeron. Uh, I'm an attorney at Myrick O'Connell. Myrick O'Connell is a 60-person full-service law firm. We have offices in Westboro and Worcester. Since I joined Myrick, the thing I've loved about it is I get to just do elder law. And there's somebody else there that can figure out everything else, which I don't get at all. So the first presentation that we did, which was last month, we talked about um, dealing with Alzheimer's in the later stages, because that's when peop what people are thinking, typically thinking a lot about is there nursing home care, assisted living, trying to deal with it if you're still at home and you've got advanced stage Alzheimer's so that people could, we could kind of get past that. Uh, I know it may seem kind of out of order, but we wanted to, to spend time tonight talking about early stage Alzheimer's, talking about what Alzheimer's is, um, ways that you can try to reduce the likelihood that you're going to get, that, that, that the Alzheimer's is going to progress at a really rapid rate, and kind of who the players are. As, one of the things that I've really come to appreciate doing elder law is my job is to tell, say a little bit about law, but really a lot of it is about just introducing the players that you need to know to understand how to deal with things as a senior because the programs for seniors are like all over the place. So um, we're gonna, what we're going to talk about a little bit is we're, we're always going to talk about my friends Frank and Mary uh, and their children Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. They are 70 years old. Uh, they have a home here in Holliston that's worth about $300,000. Not really like really big, but the mortgage is paid off. He's got an IRA worth, worth $150,000. They've got an annuity of $100,000. They've got bank accounts worth about seventy-five. dollars so they have total assets of about $625,000. Um, he has Social Security income and a pension, so he's making about $2,000 a month. She is getting half of his Social Security check, or seven fifty dollars a month. So, between the two of them, they've got no big, they got no mortgage. They're making about thirty thousand dollars a year, and they're going to be okay. They're going to be okay as long as they don't have some kind of serious health issue. Now, a lot of times when I'm talking to folks like that, and by the way, those are their children, Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. And their goal in life is very simple: they want to die and be buried in the backyard. They've lived in this house forever. Uh, even if one dies, they want to make sure the other one is safe and they want to make sure that when the two of them have died that whatever they have left over goes to their kids. I bet this sounds familiar, right? This I see a lot of people that this is basically kind of what their, what their goal in life is. When, when these folks are talking to me, because typically I start talking to people when they're about 65, they've, they've, they've got three issues on their mind. One of them is typically not death. One of the nice things about older folks is they all get the fact they're going to die, and they kind of get over it. It's like the kids don't quite get that, but you know that's one of the nice things about getting older is you all realize you're going to die. What they're worried about is not death. They know that's coming. I mean, it's not great, but they face that. They worry about this. They worry about having becoming infirm. They worry about frailty. They worry about heart problems. They really worry about cancer. This used to be their number one worry for many, many, many years. But now, actually, their number one worry is Alzheimer's disease. They worry about all of these things, and they, they'll come to me and they'll say, well, what should I be doing? And what I typically will tell folks is, you know, try to stay healthy, you know, and do a couple of very, very basic things. You know, the, 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 the only two things that I tell people you have to have early on um, as you're just getting older, if you're worried about any of this stuff, are those. And we're going to talk about those a little bit later on, but you really want to make sure that you are sure that if you have become incapacitated, that there's somebody who can sign documents for you and make legal decisions for you and transfer assets for you, do all that stuff. And you want to make sure that there's somebody who can make medical decisions for you. Because if there isn't, it is, there are these disastrous <coughs> ramifications. If you, are, if you have that heart attack 
and there's nobody that can sign things for you at the hospital, you've got a big problem because even actually your spouse does not have the legal right to make medical decisions for you. Uh, if you are having to deal with Alzheimer's related issues and they involve asset transfers, and we're going to talk to the, about them a little bit later on, but there's nobody who has the power to sign a power of attorney to make those asset transfers for you, then you've got a big problem. Uh, because you probably can't do the things you need to do to qualify for mass health and do a lot of other things. We're going to talk about that a little later on. So, the, but the biggest concern, as I mentioned, is, is that as Frank and Mary are getting older, they realize, well, if they have a stroke um, or if they have a heart attack or if they have cancer, actually, Medicare, health insurance for the old, is probably going to cover most of their medical bills. It ain't going to be fun. You know, it's going to be a really difficult road and there are, you know, frailty is not great. But at least the medical bills aren't going to kill them, right? Um, Alzheimer's disease, though, is the hole in the Medicare system. Um, you can, because in order to qualify, in order to get Medicare to pay things for you, you need to need skilled care. They'll pay for chemotherapy and operations and all these things, but they're not going to pay for the cost of having somebody come to your house and help you get across the room. Or, or assist to make sure you're there, that, you're, that someone's there if you're taking a shower, because that isn't skilled care, so Medicare doesn't cover any of that, which is why so many people are concerned about Alzheimer's, both from the perspective of, of just personally having to go through a lot, and also from the financial perspective. So what I've, a I've asked, and, and when you're thinking about dealing with Alzheimer's or trying to figure Alzheimer's out, the most important thing you can do is Take that information down. <laughs> um, the Alzheimer's Association is, is there to provide really two kinds of things. And, and Julie McMurray from the Alzheimer's Association is here this evening, and she's going to be really talking to you more in detail about Alzheimer's disease. But one thing you need to know kind of before she even stands up is that if there is an emergency, if, if you have a question, there isn't an emergency, but you're just curious about gee, you know, my spouse or my mother or my uncle has got some, some, is doing some strange things. I'm wondering if this is an issue and you want someone to talk to and you want someone to suggest to you whom you could talk to um, around here. There is a 24-hour hotline that the Alzheimer's Association runs. It's run nationally, but it, they, they refer to people right in this area. They'll tell you the people you can talk to. If it's an emergency, if things aren't going well, it's the middle of the night, and your spouse is yelling and screaming, and what do I do? Same thing. You, they're always available. They're, they're, they're a tremendous resource here and really across the Commonwealth. But I wanted Julie to be talking about Alzheimer's disease, what, you know, what, kind of dispel some myths about it, and also talk to you how, about how you can deal with it. My friend Julie McMurray. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. As Arthur mentioned, uh, my name is Julie McMurray. I am the regional manager for the Central Regional Office of the Alzheimer's Association. I am part of the Massachusetts, New Hampshire chapter of the Alzheimer's Association. Our main office is in Watertown, with regional offices in Worcester, Raynham, Springfield, and uh, Bedford, New Hampshire. Then we are part of the National Alzheimer's Association with our um, main offices in Chicago and then there are chapters in every single state throughout the United States. Our mission at the Alzheimer's Association really is to enhance care and support for people living with Alzheimer's, their family and their caregivers. We're also one of the largest um, private funders of research. I always say, I'd like to be out of a job someday. I've been with the Alzheimer's Association for almost 13 years. I've been in the field specific to Alzheimer's disease and dementia for all, over 20. And I had um, a family member um, pass away from Alzheimer's disease. Um, so it is very near and dear to my heart. And until the time we find a cure or means of prevention, please know that the Alzheimer's Association really is here to provide support, information, um, and education, and really to help navigate um, the resources. Um, so some of the statistics that I think are important to mention is that currently there are over 5 million Americans living with Alzheimer's disease. That is pretty significant. Um, you know, people are living a lot longer than we did 30 and 40 years ago. We have found cures and preventatives 
for illnesses that um, otherwise 40 years ago people died from. So we are living longer and age is the business, biggest risk factor. Our baby boomers right now are our biggest um, growing population. So as we, um, as they age into their 60s and 70s and 80s, um, we are going to be looking at well over 11 million people by mid-century um, that develop Alzheimer's disease. Every 67 seconds, someone in the United, St United States develops Alzheimer's. Currently, Alzheimer's is the sixth leading cause of death in the United States. Alzheimer's is a terminal illness. People die from Alzheimer's disease. There is no cure. One in three seniors dies with Alzheimer's disease or another form of dementia. And in 2013, 15.5 million family and friends provided <laughs> over 17.7 billion hours of unpaid care that was valued at over $220 um, billion. So as Arthur mentioned, you know, really insurance doesn't pay for a lot of the care that is needed when you're caring for someone with Alzheimer's disease. Um, and this disease could bankrupt our health care system as we know it. So how many of you are concerned about your memory? <laughs> how many of you forget? Okay. You know what, forgetfulness is is really part of normal aging. As we um, get older, we forget. We forget where we put our glasses, where we put our, forget our, put our keys, where we um, put our cell phones, okay? So the concern with Alzheimer's disease or any type of dementia is when that forgetfulness interferes with normal day-to-day -day activities, okay? So if you forget where you put your cell phone, you usually are able to retrace your step and find the cell phone. Somebody in the early stages of Alzheimer's may forget what a cell phone is even used for, or may forget that they even lost their cell phone, okay? So we all forget, but it's when that forgetfulness interferes with normal day-to-day -day activities. So what are some normal age-related changes? Slower recall than when you were younger. More difficulty uh, recalling things like uh, new names and particular words. I mean, how many of you go in the grocery store, you're talking to someone, and you're having the conversation, and you're, you're saying, what's their name? What's their name? What's their name? <laughs> you walk away, and you're like, oh, that was Susan. You know, that's pretty typical. Okay, um, but the concern with Alzheimer's is when you see someone that you know and you do not recognize them at all. Okay, um, normal age-related uh, changes include um, harder doing several things at once, so you have a harder time multitasking, and you may have more difficulty overlooking unimportant information. So I often get the question, what is the difference between Alzheimer's disease and dementia? Okay, sometimes people use it um, like Alzheimer's disease is dementia, dementia is Alzheimer's. But there is a difference. So dementia in and of itself isn't a disease, okay? Dementia really describes the symptoms, okay? So dementia is that umbrella category that umbrella word, and then there's many different types of dementia. So dementia is not a disease or a complete diagnosis. It really, dementia is a set of symptoms, okay, which can include changes in memory, specifically short-term memory, problems with language, sometimes uh, inventing new words or language that um, is gibberish, Okay, uh, increased confusion to time and place, changes in visual or spatial perception. Sometimes that occurs when a person is driving and they take a right hand turn and they go up on the curb, okay, because it, uh, the disease changes their ability 
to um, understand relationships, spatial relationships. Poor or decreased judgment, problems with thinking, planning, and organizing tasks, changes in mood and behavior. Um, a person normally, they, if there was a change in their routine, they'd be like, oh, no problem, you know, we'll reschedule. But sometimes with Alzheimer's disease, a person has a catastrophic reaction and can't let things go and become very um, upset. Um, and there's changes in personality. So those are the dementia symptoms. And then there are many types of illnesses that can cause those symptoms, okay? So there are ir irreversible um, types of dementia. Alzheimer's disease is the most common form of dementia. It's estimated that there's about 70% uh, of all dementias are of the Alzheimer's type. Vascular dementia, uh, which is usually brought on by a vascular illness like a stroke, um, could be a major stroke or smaller strokes. Parkinson's disease has a um, dementia component to it. Uh, Lewy body dementia and frontal temporal lobe dementia or Pick's disease. So those are all types of irreversible dementias, meaning that um, they're progressive in nature and you're not, you cannot change the outcome um, of the disease process. Now there are some illnesses that can cause those dementia-like symptoms, but are treatable. Um, so a brain tumor, if someone's experiencing a brain tumor, they may be more confused. Um, they may have some mood and behavior changes. But when the, a brain tumor is treated, they can go back and function normally. Same thing with normal pressure hydrocephalus, which is fluid on the brain. Uh, any type of infection, urinary tract infection, kidney infection can cause somebody to be more confused. A vitamin deficiency, so a person that has low vitamin B12 can be more lethargic, more confused. Depression masks the symptoms of Alzheimer's disease and dementia. And certainly medication side effects or medications that are uh, interacting negatively with another medication can have dementia-like symptoms. So going through the uh, diagnostic workup really is key to know what it is you're dealing with because it may not be Alzheimer's or another form of dementia at all. It could be depression. It could be normal pressure hydrocephalus. It could be uh, some type of infection that is treated. So why is it important to get a diagnosis? To rule out reversible causes, okay? Um, you really want to have access to symptomatic treatment. So there are medications that can treat symptoms of Alzheimer's disease, okay? And they're not disease-modifying medications. They don't really change the course of the disease, but it can really help to slow the progression but certainly a person that may be experiencing some symptoms of depression, there's also uh, medications to uh, treat that as well. Getting a diagnosis early, really a person and a family can plan for the future. And one of the things I often talk about is addressing legal and financial issues. You have a window of opportunity that you really want to sit down with an elder law attorney and talk about um, addressing the legal and financial issues. But also establishing a support network, a care team. You cannot um, care for your loved one with Alzheimer's by yourself. So it takes family, it takes friends, it takes the Alzheimer's Association, it takes a network of people and support network to really help uh, maintain your loved one at home and that's usually the goal is to keep your loved one at home. And you can start by calling us and we can really help educate you, um, provide you with uh, information on community resources, um, and provide you with the support um, throughout the journey. Certainly, um, getting a diagnosis sooner than later, it can um, help to treat any health, other health issues or stroke-related risk factors. 
and diagnosis can really expand uh, the medical support network so you might not only uh, have to deal with the primary care physician but he may refer you to a neurologist he may refer you to a clinical neuropsychologist that does some uh, testing to de uh, help determine what strengths and weaknesses your loved one may have they may refer to a psychiatrist as well so it really does expand the medical uh, network for you and getting um, a diagnosis, um, we certainly encourage involvement in clinical trials. Research really is the key, and we often talk about needing people to participate in clinical trials. Um, and we have a program at the Alzheimer's Association called uh, Trial Match. And I have information on in, um, the back of the uh, table where we can connect you with clinical trials in your area. Not always medication-based, might be prevention, diet-based, might be some caregiver surveys, um, but it's really um, a wonderful way to really um, meet our goal of creating a world without Alzheimer's. So what are the services that we can assist families with? And I, I will always say that our helpline truly is a gateway. Um, as Arthur mentioned, um, that 1-800 number, our helpline is accessible 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, you will always speak to someone, whether you call at 12 noon or 12 midnight. You will speak to a, clin uh, a trained clinician to really help to support you, answer a question, uh, provide information and referral to a service that may, you may need, but really it does open up um, the gateway for other um, services um, that you can have um, access to. As a result of our helpline, we developed a program called Care Consultation. We will sit down with families and help develop an action plan, and that um, can be in the form of a phone call, through email, or uh, an in-person care consultation at our office and really we try to listen to your concerns what you're dealing with because Alzheimer's disease is not a cookie cutter disease if you've met one person with Alzheimer's you've met one person with Alzheimer's um, and really every situation is unique and so we really try to help guide families on addressing what they need to and how to go about addressing that need we do education programs. Um, I do all of the programs in Worcester County um, for family members. They're free of charge. And I do believe education um, and knowledge is power. And if you have the right information, you can make the right decisions for your loved one. And with this disease, with Alzheimer's and any type of dementia, you really have to be proactive. You can't wait till a crisis situation. You have to know what you're dealing with and you have to have the information to really make good decisions, not only for your loved one, but for yourself as a caregiver. Um, we do multicultural outreach. We have a um, Medic Alert Safe Return program, which is a wanderer's alert system. People with Alzheimer's disease and dementia do wander. It's estimated that six out of 10 people with Alzheimer's disease will win wander. The Safe Return program was developed back in the 1990s with the United States Justice Department, and it works everywhere in the United States. So it's, um, you know, when somebody walks away from their home, the family calls us um, when they're enrolled in this program. We say stay at home, and we act as liaisons to getting local police, uh, first responders, uh, search and rescue teams out looking for your loved one. Support groups, we have over 225 support groups in Massachusetts alone for caregivers, as well as um, individuals living in the early stages of the D disease, as well as um, individuals that have been diagnosed with young onset Alzheimer's, which occurs before the age of 60. Um, we do a lot of public policy and advocacy work, both locally and federally. Um, we recently passed a law into place to making sure that nursing homes um, had standards of care if they were to offer an Alzheimer's care unit. They had to have a certain amount of training for their staff, offer a specific amount of uh, programming um, 
to really make sure that there's good quality of care uh, for individuals in a uh, nursing home setting. We did that about eight years ago um, for assisted livings. Um, and again, you know, we're one of the leaders in research and our goal really is to create a world without Alzheimer's. Um, if you, the end of this program, if you have um, any interest in becoming involved with the trial match program, please let me know and I'll also be available um, to answer any questions. Thank you. The, the, the trial match program, and by the way, we're going to take questions for uh, all three speakers at, at the end, but that trial match program is really, really, really important. I think so, so much of the, the, that what the Alzheimer's Association has come to, learn, has come to appreciate through the research they funded is I mean, no, one, no one is talking about having figured out a way to get all those dead brain cells that have been dead or dead as a result of Alzheimer's back alive again. But more and more, there is research on how to slow the progress of Alzheimer's down. As I've always told people, like my mother died in a nursing home. That's one of the reasons I got involved in this back in the 90s. I wouldn't mind, you know, and, and I have an older, we have one of my older brothers now got an early stage diagnosis, so we're kind of nervous about this, you know. Uh, I wouldn't mind having Alzheimer's as long as I'm 105, you know. So as long as, <laughs> as, long as, as, long as I can kind of outlive it, and so much of the goal of the research is to figure out uh, they can, you can more and more one of the, some of the research that's been, one, some of the research that's been done has been to be able to detect people who have the disease before they have the symptoms. Once you can do that, or or that they've got very very early symptoms, because once you can do that, then you can start doing some testing, and you can say, okay, among those folks, what can we do to see the strategies for slowing that down? Because that's the goal. You just want to slow it down. You know, if we're all 105 when we get it, well then that's great. So, the, it, it, but. And, but more kind of at the heart of this is the Alzheimer's Association is kind of the place to go to deal with any of these questions, especially, especially if you want to stay home. And uh, like Frank and Mary, most of us want to stay home. Certainly there are more and more sophisticated memory care units at assisted living communities. Um, I know there's a terrific one up in Hopkinton. There's a brand new place being built in Ashland. But those, those are very expensive alternatives and they're not home. And they're not home. So if you're, if in terms of staying at home, the, one of the keys is the Alzheimer's Association. The other key is Bay Path Elder Services. How many here have heard of Bay Path Elder Services? Raise your hand. About half. You have to know Bay Path Elder Services if you are older, for any, for just if you're older. Uh, the Bay Path Elder Services is an ASAP, an Aging Services Access Point. Uh, Massachusetts is divided into 27 regions, each one is served by an aging services access point. These are nonprofit organizations that contract with the state and the federal government. They're not there to sell you anything. They are your tax dollars at work, right? They're the place, if you, if you call the Council on Aging because you've got, you, you know, you need home care, you're interested in Meals on Wheels, you need Lifeline, one of the things they're gonna do is they're gonna have you talk to somebody from Bay Path Elder Services about what your eligibility is and that's kind of the, one of the big points of Bay Path. So you want to understand what Bay Path is, what Bay Path does. Dana Levitt from Bay Path is here to talk about some of those programs and especially programs that, might, that you might be interested in if you have a concern that you or your, or your loved one may have early stage Alzheimer's. And then I'm going to talk a little bit more about those programs after she goes through them. But Dana Levitt from Bay Path Elder Services. Here you go. Yeah, the, but I'm going I'm to give her my technology Sorry. lesson. That's forward. That's back. That's all I know. That's all. Okay. That's all anything more than that, it, uh, it blows up. If you don't, that, that's forward. Oh, enough. Okay? Good. Good. So, hi, I'm Dana. I'm a case manager at Bay Path Elder Services. Um, so, hopefully, I'll do a good job. Um, oh, oops. That's back. There we go. You got it. <laughs> so, you got so Bay Path is an aging and disability. Um, we're resource specialists. Um, so we help with um, long-term services and supports and person-centered consultation um, to help you make the, uh, the choice to stay at home. Um, so Bay Path, information and referral. It's just worth a phone call. Um, it's free. There's no charge to call us. Um, so like Arthur said, mm -hmm. someone from your local Council on Aging, if you have an in-home need, if you have something if you're a caregiver um, and you know that your spouse needs something or you know your um, 
daughter or son or your mom and dad needs something, <laughs> then um, it's free to call us. There's no charge to call us. Um, we'll tell you if you're eligible. Um, there will be a series of questions. Um, option counseling is another service that we offer. Um, it's a short-term service. Um, we kind of help you guide through your long-term options to kind of see what the best fit is going to be for you. Um, home care program. Um, so that's kind of my area of expertise. But um, we provide services such as in-home companion. Um, if you just want to stay at home with someone and you're lonely, and you just want to read with someone for an hour, if you want to just talk, I want to go through my photo album. Um, if you want to play cards, if you want to go outside and take a walk, it's, it's just one of the biggest things is that, that we hear of is that people are isolated, that they're home by themselves. And so it's just a nice, it's some comfort for your family, it's some comfort for you know, your neighbors or other people that are concerned about you that someone is coming just to check in and say hi. Um, Adult Day Health, that might be another option and something that we can help you with. Um, again, so that you're not home for long periods of time, someone we can offer help with that. If you want to go to a, a, an Adult Day Health and get out, that's, it's great. It's some respite for some family so that they're not worried about you being home by yourself. And then you're also getting that so, so socialization, you're with other people. Um, we call anytime. We know lots of wonderful facilities. Um, personal care, if you need help getting in and out of the shower, it can just be supervision. I know some people are just so scared. Uh, it's, a, it, you know, it's an intimate thing, bathing. Um, so it can just be there to supervise you. It can just be there to wash your feet. Um, if you need assistance getting dressed or undressed, if you just come home from the hospital and you're still rehabbing an injury, this is something that we can help you with. Um, then we can help with transportation. If you're unable to get to doctor's appointments, we're able to help you. Um, if you need an escort, you know, we'll do everything. There's a transportation line that all you have to do is call, say the date of your appointment, the time of your appointment, where you're going, and then we, we do everything else for you. Um, so if you need an appointment, or if you need a, to go to the doctor, we will help you. Um, we have dementia coaching for caregivers. We have a wonderful caregiver program. Um, our caregiver specialist um, is amazing. Um, she offers training, support um, for you. It's one-on-one -on -one if you need that extra time they will call, um, but we have trainings all the time. We know of lots of, lots of events that are going on. Um, meals on Wheels, home delivered meals. Um, for some people, it could be their only meal of the day. Um, and they're really, they're large meals, they're delicious. I had my first one a couple of weeks ago. Um, it was really good. Um, and they're really big, so some people eat a little bit for lunch and then they eat a little bit more for dinner. Um, and I should say, homemaking is another, is another huge service that people want. Um, they want, they can't get to the grocery store anymore. So it's that one-on-one, -on -one, you know, you can sit with an aide and you can say, here's what I like. You know, you can, it's not just sending them and hoping that they come back with the right thing. Um, you can really sit down with them, make sure that they're getting what you want. Um, they can do your laundry, um, light cleaning if you need someone to, you know, mop the floor for you. Um, if you need someone to change your bed, wash your sheets, we can do all of that. Um, we provide, um, I should say, so. Um, and, by, and how much does that all cost again? Well, it depends. So it's going to depend. That's some of the first, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, but, but not much. But not much. No, it could be as little as a voluntary copayment of $9. So you don't even have to pay anything. So they'll look at, they'll ask you, that's part of, so you can call information referral and say, I'm interested, I just want to talk about services. If they find that you're eligible, they will schedule an intake and assessor to come to your house and talk about um, if you're eligible. So they're going to ask you all those questions. What do you get for Social Security? If you have any pensions, any disability, any annuities, anything like that, and then they'll figure out your copay. Um, so like I said, it could be as little as a voluntary copayment of $9. Um, some people, it just depends on your income. Um, but it, it's the alternative. You want to stay at home. Uh, it's, it's a wonderful service to be able to stay at home and control and dictate what you want to, you know, how you want to live the rest of your life. Um, so that we also have SCO One Care, um, kind of the same idea as the home care, but it depends on the, the doctors that are within your network. Um, so you could be able to check and ask your doctor, do you take SCO um, or do you take One Care? What is SCO? SCO is Senior Care Options. Oh. Um, so I can give you a little, I brought a little cheat sheet. Um, so you have to be age 65 or plus and you have to be enrolled in a Senior Care Option Program. Um, Medicare and MassHealth eligible, and you have to make sure that you reside in the SCO area. 
uh, but they help with all the same things in terms of um, care management, homemaking, food shopping. Um, they use all the same vendors. It's just depending on the doctors if your doctor takes that insurance. Uh, so PCA and AFC. Um, PCA is personal care attendant. Also, you have to be on Mass Health. Um, but you get to hire the worker. Um, so instead of um, some people, it could be you could be waiting sometimes with services. Um, you could be waiting to find an aide, so this is a good way that you get to control, this is who I want to come into my home. Um, so you get to go on care.com <coughs> um, and find, find the worker that fits you. So you're in control of that. Um, with AFC, um, that can be someone, it just can't be a spouse, but uh, same thing, you get to pick the worker. Um, so it could be a neighbor, it could be... Um, can it be a child? Yes, it could be a son or daughter, yes, yes. <coughs> um, just as long as you're living with them. Um, I should say money management is another program. A lot of people, it's hard to continue to pay bills. I have a lot of clients, they're still, un, you know, they can still pay their bills, but they just can't write the checks. So it's <coughs> nice to have someone come in there with them. You're doing all the billing together, and then it's just help with the checks. Um, but for a lot of people, it's overwhelming, can, you know, taking care of bills. I'm overwhelmed. Um, it's, it's a lot. So it's really nice. They're volunteers. Um, so they're doing this, they're taking their time, they want to do this, they love to do this, um, they're amazing. Um, so like I said, the caregiver support program, um, she's a, our new, our caregiver specialist, amazing, provides support, resources, information, um, a lot of wonderful trainings, um, information. Um, if you need that one-on-one, -on -one, um, sometimes it's just so much as like, how are you? You know, asking the caregiver, how are you doing? And that's just so nice for them to hear because it can be a lot to take care of someone. Um, so it's just that extra, that cushion, that extra hug. Um, and so services are available to all caregivers, no charge. That's just part of our, that's part of our service. Um, we also have some other services, um, elder community care. That's um, for some people um, in terms of if you need an extra, someone to talk to, um, someone from advocates can reach out to you. So that's nice for people. So what do we have to do? Call you up to find out yeah. how much to charge? Exactly. Or, exactly. Yeah. Call and which see if you're. Free and which, uh, yep. And I brought. Um, uh, which ones are free? Which ones are $2? Oh, which ones are free? <laughs> which ones are $2? Um, I, brought, I brought these sheets. I'm sorry if I cheat sheets. Um, so if you want inf more information or if you need any information, I'd be happy to answer questions. Um, with our telephone number, we're open from 9 to 5. Call anytime. Our information and referral specialists are there answer all your questions and then they can schedule an intake for an assessor to come out and see if you're eligible and talk about what you want. So you are in control. So, so and they're all like her, you know? They're Not like these, nervous, they're like these sweet people. You know, I mean, the people don't go into this kind of work because they're grumpy, you know? It's because they're very interested in helping people. Yes. Dana, thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. And, and, and if you're an email person, so get, take that website. That's caregivingmetrowest.org. Right? It's a terrific website. If you click onto the website, this is, it, was, it was done by Baypath with a big state grant. Um, it, you can basically click on it by community and they'll tell you all the services available, the, care, the, the providers in your community, in your community. So it's really, really wonderful. And, and it is true, it is ju you just call them and they give you all this information and they are your tax dollars at work. Now to give you a sense of what some of these co-pays might be about. For example, um, uh, Dana was referring to these programs that will actually provide caregivers for you at home. These are paid for with state dollars, so they are not programs like Mass Health for which you, there is an asset criterion that you can only qualify if your assets are really low. Um, there is a co-pay involved. Um, the, there are two programs, one called Basic and one called ECOP, and in e both of those programs they'll provide I want to say from 6 to 12 hours a week of care at home. Now, if you're Frank and Mary and giving the incomes that, you, that they have, your copay for, for that would be about 100, I think it's exactly $101 per month, right? This is for, for imagine this now, this is 12 hours of home care. If you were buying home care in the market right now, it would cost you 20 to $25 an hour. You're talking... 12 hours of home care a week for four week or 40, 48 hours, round to 50 so that I can do this in my head. 50 times 20 would be 1,000, 50 times 25 would be more than that. So you're getting over $1,000 worth of services, your copay is $101 a month, 
right? These are state dollars that are paying for this. These are your tax dollars at work, right? So they're really substantial programs. Um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about, I'm going to go back to Frank and Mary because once again, we're talking about people who are in the early, or who have got perhaps early stage dementia or don't have it at all. They're just worried about it, right? And they're trying to figure out what they can do. I want to kind of dispel one of the myths about this, which is that if you're Frank and Mary, you have to give everything away and you have to wait five years. That is not the case. And the re the, to understand that, you need to understand about what would happen if Frank and Mary were really in distress here. So, if Fra if, so those, are the, those are Frank and Mary's assets. If Mary needed to go to a nursing home, right, uh, or needed so much care that she was eligible for a nursing home and wanted to stay home and therefore needed to qualify for mass health, how many people here think that first they need to spend down a lot of their money before they could qualify? No, you're all wrong. You're all wrong. And the reason for that is that the, the, the way Mass Health works, for, first, if you need nursing home care, if Mary needed nursing home care, Mary, in order to qualify for Mass Health, would have to have less than $2,000 in countable assets. But Frank, the spouse at home, can own the home as long as it has an equity of less than about $820,000 can have cash or cash equivalent assets like these things, IRA, annuity, all that jazz, as long as it's the, the total value is less than, less than $119,220. Don't ask me where these figures come from. They come from the sky. This is the, they change all the time. These are regs. But most importantly, Frank, the spouse at home, can have unlimited income. So literally, if Mary needed nursing home care today, tomorrow she could simply shift all of her assets to Frank the day after that, he could go buy an annuity if, as long as he could keep 100000 or up to 119000 He could take the rest of his money and go buy an annuity, which is simply an income stream, as long as that annuity called for monthly payments over a term that was shorter than his life expectancy, which if he's 80 years old, his life expectancy is about uh, seven or eight years. Um, the purchase of that annuity is a legitimate conversion from an asset to an income stream. So literally, in this case, if Mary needed nursing home care, if they had all their assets, just to own them jointly, just like Frank and Mary and most couples, they could simply do all of this shifting and immediately qualify Mary for nursing home care, right? So the significance of that is the, and so that just by transferring the assets to Frank, and if Frank are over, is over this magic number, I'm sorry, this number is wrong, it's now 119,220, then simply buying an annuity. So, so Actually, Frank and Mary don't have to, way ahead of time, do a lot of planning if they're worried about that. Similarly, there is another program run by MassHealth, and MassHealth, once again, is the message's name for the Medicaid program, called the Frail Elder Waiver. Frail Elder Waiver works this way. If, you, if, ba if in the opinion of BayPath, these people, I always tell people the moral of this story is they, you want them to be your friend, right? You want to, you want to know the people at BayPath. They are the people who certify on behalf of MassHealth whether you are eligible for nursing home care. If they have said that you are eligible, and by the way, you're eligible for nursing home care if you either need assistance with two of the activities of daily living, regular assistance, and they are, this is always like a test, bathing, eating, dressing, toileting, and transferring. Locomotion Tran outside the home. Hmm? Locomotion outside the home. Or if you need regular supervision because otherwise you're a danger to yourself. That is, you have Alzheimer's, you're afraid you might wander away. In either of those cases, for mass health purposes, you are eligible for nursing home care. Now, not that that's when you would go to the nursing home. The nursing home is like the last place you'd want to go. But once you're eligible, that also means you're eligible if, if BayPath says that with a given number of home care hours from home care providers, you could stay home. MassHealth will pay for all that, all of that. Mary, if it's the Frank and Mary situation, has to have less than $2,000 in countable assets. And, in, and Mary would have to have income. There's an income requirement of less than $2,199 now per month. Um, but the point is, Frank's income doesn't get counted. And none of Frank's assets get counted. So in the Frank and Mary situation, if, Frank, if Mary wanted to stay home, and was otherwise eligible for nursing home care, she could simply shift all of her assets to Frank. The next day, she'd qualify, right? So you don't have to do a lot of this kind of long-term planning as long as Frank doesn't die, right? As long as Frank doesn't die. Because, of course, if Frank's dead and Frank's plan was basically with Mary that he was going to leave everything to his wife, 
Well, now Mary's got a problem because now Mary's got all those assets, which she's going to have to spend down to $2,000 in order to qualify. And that's why what, what you, what the one thing that you do kind of want to do, and that's why, as, as, as Julie said, if you were talking to an elder law attorney, one of the things they tell you is get your wills changed, Frank and Mary, to make sure that they say that if, one, that if I, you die, everything that would have gone to your spouse is instead going to get held in trust for her benefit. As long as the will says that, and as long as you own the assets at the moment of your death, your spouse is going to be totally protected. The other thing, though, that you're going to need, and now I'm going back to the powers of attorney that I mentioned earlier. In this situations that I described, when Mary is getting incapacitated and wants to either qualify for mass health in the nursing home or at home, to do that, she has to shift all of her assets to Frank, which she can't do if she's incapacitated, unless she's already signed a power of attorney giving somebody the power to do that on her behalf. I regularly, and I had this happen this week, I had this happen where a couple came in and they showed me, the pow they showed me a power of attorney, but it was, it was no good in Massachusetts. It had been done out of state. And they, there is no way that they can shift the assets from the wife to the husband in order to qualify the wife for mass health without going through a guardianship process and a conservatorship process in the probate court, which is terrible. So for, the, for the, this, this, what appears to be an insignificant document, power of attorney, can really, really give Frank and Mary the power to do all of this stuff. Um, the only other thing I would mention is if Frank were, if were dead and Mary hadn't done any planning, um, then the, the, in that case, and in that case only, if she wanted to be safe, and that's why Julie talked about the value of planning in advance, she would have to transfer assets out to her children, to an irrevocable trust, to somebody, and wait five years. Um, finally, if, if you thought any of this was interesting, but you can't remember what I said because I talked too fast, or, or you want to see Dana on TV again, and you haven't seen it on Holliston Cable, then you can check uh, Frank and Mary actually have their own website. It's called Elder Law Frank and Mary, and you can watch this or any of the shows um, that we do. The goal, and, and finally, Frank and Mary also have a team. So this is an ad for the Alzheimer's Association. <laughs> I started talking about them. This is another ad. Their biggest fundraising event of the year is in September. Actually, October 4th this year. October 4th. Yes, That's, Monday, October glad 4th. I asked. Glad I asked. <laughs> And Frank and Mary have a team that do that Alzheimer's walk. It's on, on they're, they saw on Sunday? Yep, Sunday at Quinn Sigamon Community College, but there are 11 walks throughout Massachusetts and New Hampshire. There's uh, pamphlets at the back table with information on our walk. You gotta do it. It's I mean, if, you, you know, if you've had somebody in your family who has had Alzheimer's problems, if you're worried about it, this is the future. It may not be the future for some of us, because some of us are pretty old, you know? But for our kids, I mean, it may, it, I, it, it's probably too late for me already, but for my kids, you know, the future, as Julie says, is that we're not talking about this anymore because we've taken care of it. And the answer, the way that's going to happen is through the Alzheimer's Association. So, thank you very much. Any questions to any of the speakers or to me? Thank you. Oh, and that's the goal of all of this, to sleep well at night. <laughs> oh, the goal of life. You know, you get, you know, when you're younger, it was money and all this stuff. You get older, the goal in life is to sleep well at night. So hopefully this was helpful.